Hello everyone, today we'll be going over accounts, February, March 2021, paper 1, 2. This is a multiple choice paper and we have a time limit of one hour. So let's get started. A business values its inventory at the lower of cost and the net realizable value. We need to figure out which accounting concept is being applied. So the first option given is business entity concept and it states that a business and its owners are treated as two separately identifiable parties, which is not what we're talking about in the question. So option A is incorrect. The second option given is duality concept and it states that every business transaction requires recordation in two different accounts. And we're not talking about recording any type of transaction. So option B is incorrect as well. The third option given is the matching concept and it states that a business should record expenses alongside revenues earned and we're not talking about any types of expenses or revenues in the question so option c is incorrect as well and the last option given is the prudence concept and it states that a business should not overstate any incomes or assets and we're talking about inventory which is an asset right and it's given that a business values its inventory at the lower of cost and the net realizable value when you're valuing it at the lower of the two given choices we're actually not overstating the asset which is inventory in this case so the concept being applied is the prudence concept so option d is our, our correct answer on first may tom sold an old motor vehicle with a netbook value of ten thousand to arnold for twelve thousand and Arnold paid $7,500 by check and agreed to pay the balance by installments. Now we need to figure out the net effect of these transactions on Arnold's accounting equation on 1st May. So let's first talk about the assets. Uh, now Arnold's asset will increase by $12,000 because he's purchasing an old motor vehicle with a value of $12,000. So that's going to add $12,000 to the non-current section. Then Arnold paid $7,500 by check. So that's a reduction in the bank balance. So that's going to be negative $7,500 on the current asset section. So the total is going to be a positive $4,500. So positive indicates that this is an increase. Now this is given in option C and option D. Let's look at the liability section now. So Arnold bought the motor vehicle for 12000 but he has only paid the 7500 which means that the remaining balance to be paid is going to be the liability. That's 12000 minus 7500 which will be 4500 So that's positive as well. So this indicates an increase of 4500 in the liability section, which is given in option B and option D. Now let's look at the owner's equity or capital. So we're talking about buying an old motor vehicle which results in an increase in asset and we're talking about paying through check and an additional amount is yet to pay so that's going to increase the liability but there's going to be no effect on the owner's equity or capital which is given by option a and option d so the correct option for all three of these headings assets liabilities and owner's equity is given in option d that's going to be our final answer which item is not included as a part of the capital cost of a new machine so capital cost is going to be those items which are non-recurring in nature so we need to find the item that's not included meaning we need to find the item that's recurring in nature so let's look at option a that's the cost of delivering the machine to the factory this is a non-recurring thing because you do not need to deliver the machine more than once the second one is the cost of installing the new machine. So that's of non-recurring nature as well, because you do not need to install a machine more than once. The third one is interest on a loan. So interest is something that's going to be paid every year. So that's recurring in nature, which means that this is not going to be included as part of the capital cost. The correct answer is gonna be option C. Let's look at D as well. That's the invoice price of the machine. So that's the purchase of a machine. And purchase of machine is an item that's non-recurring in nature. A business does not purchase a machine more than once in a current year. So that's gonna be of capital cost. Why does a business charge depreciation on its non-current assets? The first one is to retain profits for the replacement of worn out assets. So that's incorrect. The second one is to show the correct value of the asset in the statement of financial position. So although 
we include the net book value in the statement of financial position that's not the only reason that the depreciation is being charged we're talking only about the statement of financial position but we also know that depreciation is included as an expense in the income statement which is not included in this option so option b is incorrect as well the third one is to show when an asset needs replacing so that's incorrect as well and the final one is to spread the cost of the asset over their useful lives so this is the reason why depreciation is charged on non-current assets of a business so option d is the correct one the net book value of motor vehicles of a company is shown we're given the net book value at the beginning of the year and at the end of the year and during the year an old vehicle was traded in as part exchange for a new vehicle then the part exchange value of the old vehicle was 8000 so one thing to remember here is that this is the part exchange value and not the net book value all right then the remaining purchase price of the new vehicle 30000 was paid by check but we're not given any information regarding the net book value of the asset which was traded in as a part exchange so we're just going to consider the net book value as zero here all right now i'm going to drop the schedule for the motor vehicles so that's going to be net book value at the beginning plus any new acquired assets so that's going to be additional assets purchased but we're going to record it at the cost and we're going to get rid of the disposed vehicles but we're going to record it at the net book value and we also charge the depreciation so this is going to be depreciation for the year and this gives us the total as the net book value at the end of the year all right we need to figure out the depreciation charge so this is what we need to figure out now the net book value at the beginning is going to be 312,000 net book value at the end is going to be 305,000 the additional we're going to record it at cost so let's just figure out the additional value so this contains two value the first one will be the part, part exchange value of 8,000 and the second part is going to be the value that is being paid by check. So that's 30,000. So this gives us the total cost of 38,000. All right, then the dispose that's going to be recorded at the net book value. But like I said before, only the part exchange value is given and no information regarding the net book value is given. That's why we're going to consider the net book value as zero. The net book value at the beginning of the year is going to be 312,000. Plus the additional cost is 38,000. The disposed net book value is going to be zero and the depreciation charge, we're going to figure that out. Then the net book value at the end of the year is going to be 305,000. Now the depreciation is going to act as a balancing figure, but I'm just going to create the equation here. So I'm going to bring the depreciation to the other side. So that's going to be depreciation equals to 312,000 plus 38,000 minus zero minus 305,000. So that gives us the depreciation charge at 45,000, which is given in option C. The bank statement of a business showed a credit balance of 4,520. So we're given the credit balance. And whenever we're talking about the bank statement, so bank statement, if it's showing a debit balance, that's going to be a bank overdraft. But if it's showing a credit balance, that's going to be the balance on your account. All right, so credit is going to be the asset and debit is going to be the liabilities. Now, this did not agree with the cash book and the following were discovered. So we're given four items. We need to figure out the bank balance to be shown in the statement of financial position. All right, I'm just going to start with the credit balance of 4,520. And the first item is the bank charges. So bank charges is already going to be adjusted in the bank balance. So we do not need to adjust this anymore. We can just ignore it. The second one is the unpresented checks paid to the suppliers. So this is something that's going to be paid, which means that the balance of 680 will be deducted from our bank account so that's going to be a negative 680 
Then the third one is a dishonor check. Again, this will already be adjusted in the bank balance. So we do not need to adjust it anymore. So we can just completely ignore the third item. And the fourth one is sales receipts of 750 had been entered in the cash book but did not appear. So sales receipts actually increases the bank balance. So we have to add the amount of 750. So that's going to be plus 750, which gives us the total amount on the bank balance at 4590. So this is also going to be the credit balance, which means that the bank balance is recorded as an asset and it's going to be a current asset, which is given in our option B as the current asset 4590. What may help a bookkeeper detect errors in the accounting records of a business? So books of original entry. This is going to be the first entry in accounting. So we cannot really figure out mistakes from the first entry. So that's going to be incorrect. The second one is sales ledger control account. We can definitely detect errors from sales ledger control account if the balance does not equal with the balance from the sales ledger. So that's going to be the correct one. The third one is statement of financial position. So statement of financial position, the assets and the capital and liabilities are always going to be equal no matter what errors made. So we cannot really detect errors from the statement of financial position. So that's incorrect. And the fourth one is the trial balance. We know that suspense account is opened whenever the trial balance debit side and the credit side does not match. So in such cases, we know that there are going to be errors and such errors can be detected with the help of trial balance. So that's true. So the correct answer is two and four, which is given in option C. The closing balance on a purchase ledger control account is 163,762. Then the purchases journal had been undercast by 1000. This means that the purchase amount recorded for this amount is also understated by 1000. So that just means that we have to add 1000 to this amount in order to figure out the correct closing balance on the purchase ledger control account. So that's going to be 163,762 plus 1000 which gives the correct balance of 164762, which is given in option C. A business has calculated its draft profit for the year as 15,000, and then the following were discovered. The first one is that the general expenses were understated by 600. So if it's understated, I'm going to have to add this amount of 600 back to the draft profit. So that's a plus. But general expenses is always deducted in order to figure out the draft profit. So that's a negative, which means that I need to deduct the value of 600. So that's going to be 15,000 minus 600. All right. The second one is that the sales journal total of 55,690 had been posted to the sales account as 56,590. This means that the sales value is actually overstated. by 56590 minus 55690. So this gives the value of 900. So sales value is actually overstated, which means that I need to deduct this value of 900. So that's a negative. But we know that sales is always added in order to figure out the draft profit. So that's another plus. And plus and minus makes up a minus again. So that just means that we need to deduct the value of 900 from the draft profit. So that's minus 900. The third one is that the repairs to vehicles of 1100 had been entered in the vehicles at cost, which means that again, the repairs to vehicles should have been entered in the expenses, but we entered it in the vehicles account, which means that the overheads are being understated. That just means that we need to add it, but the overhead is always deducted. So that's a negative, which gives us a negative again. So the amount of 1100 needs to be deducted as well. So that's negative 1100. And the final one is that the salaries account included traveling expenses of 2400 paid to salesmen. So salary is also deducted and then traveling expenses are also deducted. So the only error here is that this amount of 2400 is under a wrong heading, but this is treated the same. So it's already deducted. We do not need to include any changes to it. So we can just completely ignore that fourth item. So the correct profit is going to be 15,000 minus 600 minus 900 minus 1100, which gives a value of 12,400, given by option A. 
A sole trader maintains a provision for doubtful debts at 5% of trade receivables, and the provision for doubtful debts at the start of the era was 2750, and we are given the following information at the end of the year. Alright, we are given the trade receivables at the end of the year, and we are given out the bad debts written off during the year. We need to figure out the effect on the profit for the year due to the change in provision for doubtful debt. So we need to figure out the provision for doubtful debt's value for the current year. Alright, in order to figure out the provision for doubtful debts, we know that the bad debt value should always be deducted from the trade receivables. But here it's given in a tricky way. We are given the information at the end of the year, which means that this trade receivables value has already adjusted the bad debt of 500. So we do not need to reduce this 500 from the trade receivables in order to figure out the provision for doubtful debts. So the current year provision for doubtful debts is just going to be 37,500 into the rate of 5%. So that gives us the provision for doubtful debts of 18,075. So we can clearly see that the current year provision for doubtful debts has decreased as compared to the last year. So whenever it's decreased, we treat it as an income. And income always increases the profit. So we've already figured out that the profit will be increased, but by how much? So that's just going to be the difference between the provision for doubtful debts at the start of the year and the end of the year. So that's 2750 minus 1875, which gives us a value of 875. So the profit for the year actually increases by 875, which is given in our option C. SRBA has a financial year end of 31st December. On 31st March 2020, she transferred her private vehicle to the business at a value of 12,000 and her profit for the year ended 31st December 2020 was 7,800 and her cash drawings amounted to 8,000. Depreciation of 900 had been provided and she also took goods for her own use with a cost price of 1,000 and a selling price of 2,000. So we can completely ignore this selling price because she took goods for her own use which means that this is going to be drawings and drawings is always recorded at the cost price. Alright, we need to figure out the increase in SRBA's capital account balance in the year ended 31st December 2020. So we can easily figure this out by drawing up the capital account but by omitting the opening balance. So this is going to be the debit side, this is going to be the credit side. Alright, the first one we're given is that she transferred her private vehicle. So that's going to be capital injection and capital injection is always recorded on the credit side. So this 12,000 is going to be on the credit side. The next we have is that the profit for the year was 7800 and we know that SRBA is a sole trader so we do not need to divide this profit among any partners so that's just going to be recorded as a whole under the credit side so that's 7800 then her cash drawings amounted to 8000 so if it were to be a partnership then the drawings would have recorded in the current account but since we're talking about sole trader the current account and the capital account is the same so we can just record the drawings on the debit side of the capital account so that's going to be 8000 on the debit side next we have depreciation so depreciation is not recorded on the capital account it's actually recorded on the income statement so we can just completely ignore this and the last one we have is another drawings with a cost price of thousand like i said before we can completely ignore the selling price since the drawings are always recorded at the cost price so that's going to be thousand on the debit side now the increase in the capital is going to be over here so that's going to be a balancing figure so let's just figure out the total for the credit side first so that's going to be 19,800 which must be true for the debit side as well now in order to figure out the increase which is the balancing figure i'm just going to have to deduct these two values from the total amount so that's going to be 19,800 minus 8,000 minus 1,000 which gives the value of 10,800 so that's the required increase which is given in option D. At the end of his first year of trading, the trader lost all of his inventory in a fire. He knows the values of sales and purchases and wishes to calculate the value of the inventory lost. So which ratio should he use? The first one is the gross margin. We know that gross margin involves the sales. And the cost of sales and we know that the inventory value is always included in the cost of sales so if you're going to talk about um, the 
value of the inventory that can be easily figured out from the gross margin. So this is the ratio that the owner should be using. So A is our correct answer. Let's just look at the remaining options as well. The second one is the profit margin. Profit margin actually involves the sales and the profit for the year. So that's not something which is going to be useful in order to figure out the value of inventory. So that's incorrect. The third one is the trade payables turnover. It just includes the credit purchases and not the entire purchases, right? And it includes the payables amount. So that's not going to help in any way to figure out the inventory value. So that's incorrect as well. And the last one is trade receivables turnover. This is going to include the credit sales and the receivables amount. So again, that's not going to help in order to figure out the value for inventory. So D is incorrect as well. X and Y were in partnership, sharing profits and losses equally. Z was admitted as a partner and the profit and loss sharing ratio for X, Y and Z will be 2 is to 2 is to 1. All right. Now, on the date of admission, the value of the non-current assets was increased by 48,000 and the goodwill was valued at 30,000. So we need to figure out the effect on X capital account. So we can just drop the capital account, but we can completely omit the opening balance. In that way, we can figure out whether there was an increase or a decrease. But in all four of the options were given increase so we can just conclude that there has been an increase so this is the debit side that's the credit side now the first thing we're given is that the value of the non-current assets was increased so this just means the profit on revaluation and this profit will be divided among the two partners x and y equally so that's going to be twenty four thousand each and profit is something that's gonna increase the balance on the capital account so that's going to be recorded on the credit side so that's twenty four thousand. the next one we have is goodwill so goodwill is recorded on both the debit side as well as the credit side so let's just record it at the credit side first on the credit side that's recorded in the old ratio so old ratio suggests that x and y were in partnership sharing profits and losses equally so this must be divided into two equal halves that's going to be fifteen thousand each so old ratio is going to be recorded on the credit side. But under the new ratio, X's ratio is going to be 2. So that's going to be 30,000 into 2 by 5 because that's the total 2 plus 2 plus 1. All right, now the goodwill value um, based on the new ratio is going to be 12,000. Now the increased value is going to be over here. So let's just figure out the total of the credit side first that's going to be 24,000 plus 15,000 which gives a total of 39,000 which must be true for debit side as well and in order to figure out the increased amount that's just going to be 39,000 minus 12,000 which is 27,000 so the effect on the excess capital account is going to be the increase of 27,000 which is given in option C which items would appear in a partnership appropriation account in the absence of a partnership agreement the first one is profit for the year that's true the second one is partners interest on drawings so there is an absence of a partnership agreement which means that the interest on drawings is not charged so that's incorrect the third one is partners salaries again since there is an absence of a partnership agreement there is going to be no salary to any partners so that's incorrect as well and the fourth one is the partner share of profits that's true because partnerships appropriation account is maintained in order to figure out the partner's share of profits, regardless of whether the partnership has an agreement or not. So that's going to be 1 and 4, given in option A. Annie and Bernie have been in a partnership for some years, sharing profits and losses in the ratio 2 is to 1. Now, on 1st January 2020, they decided to introduce interest on drawings, and the annual interest on drawings for the year ended 31st December 2020 was 1300 for Annie and 800 for Bernie. We need to figure out the effect of this change on the balance of Annie's current account. All right, the current account records the profit, so let's just figure out the effect on profit first. So the interest on drawings is actually added in order to figure out the total share of profits. So that's going to be 1300 plus 800. So profit is going to be increased by 2100. This is going to be the effect on the total profit. Now let's just talk about profit for any. 
So they have a profit sharing ratio of 2 is to 1, which means that Annie's profit is going to be 2100 into 2 by 3, which is 1400. So that's going to be increased as well. Now I'm going to drop the current account. So this is the debit side. This is the credit side. The increment of profit also increases the value on the current account balance. So that's going to be recorded on the credit side. But the interest on drawings is something that's going to deduct the current account balance. So that's going to be recorded on the debit side. But we're only going to record the interest on drawings for Annie since this is the current account for Annie. So that's 1300 Alright, so this is the heavier side, credit side, so that's total 1400 which must be true for the debit side as well, which means that there must be an increase, because if there's a balancing figure on the debit side, that's always an increase, and if there's a balancing figure on the credit side, that's always a decrease. Alright, so the balancing figure is just going to be 1400 minus 1300 which is 100 which suggests that the capital account is actually increased by 100 which is given in option C. The total of shareholders equity at 31st December 2019 was 45,500. During the year ended 31st December 2020, the following took place. The first one is, okay, wait, let's just read the required value. So that's the balance of the shareholders equity. All right. Now, the first one is an issue of 10,000 ordinary shares of one each at a premium of 0.25 was made. So whenever there's an issue of ordinary shares, that's going to increase the value of shareholders equity. So that's going to be 10,000 into 1.25 because 1 is the nominal rate and 0.25 is going to be the premium rate, which means that the total amount by which the shareholder's equity is increased is going to be 12,500. So this needs to be added. Now, the second one is a bonus issue. So whenever there's a bonus issue, there's not going to be any changes in the shareholder's equity and there's not going to be any cash outflow and inflow. So we can just completely ignore this item. The third one is that the buildings were revalued from 250,000 to 265,000. Revaluation upwards always increases the value in the shareholder's equity. So that's going to be the difference, which is 265,000 minus 250,000 which is 15,000. So this needs to be added as well because this increases the value in the shareholder's equity. The fourth one is the profit for the year. So profit for the year also increases the shareholder's equity. So we need to add the value of 20,400. The fifth one is that there was a transfer to the general reserve. So transfer to the general reserve does not actually increase or decrease the shareholder's equity. That's just going to be the transfer of the amount from one heading to another heading so that's not going to have any change we can completely ignore this the last one is that the directors proposed a final dividend of eight thousand so if it were to be paid this would have actually deducted the shareholders equity but the directors have only proposed this meaning that cash has not yet been paid so we can ignore this value as well all right now the actual balance is going to be forty five thousand five hundred plus the issue of ordinary shares of 12,500, plus the revaluation of 15,000, and the profit of 20,400, which gives us the total value of 93,400, given in option C. The following relates to a limited company during a year. All right, we need to figure out the total net cash inflow arising from these. We need to figure out the net cash inflow, meaning that we need to adjust the cash outflow in the inflow and then figure out the total balance. All right, the first one is repayment of a debenture. So whenever we're paying the debenture, cash is going to go out of the company. So that's going to be a negative one. The second one is the receipt. So receipt means we're always receiving it, which increases the value of cash. So that's going to be an addition. The third one is non-current assets purchased. So whenever we're purchasing anything, cash is going to go out of the company and the purchased goods is going to come into the company. So that's going to be a cash out. So that's negative. Then the fourth one is the net book value of disposals. We do not consider any net book value. That's not going to bring any changes in cash inflow or cash outflow. We can completely ignore this. The fifth one is disposal proceeds, meaning that this is a value that we're going to obtain whenever we're going to dispose an asset. So this 60,000 is going to be a cash inflow to the company. So we have to add this. The last one is revaluation surplus. So revaluation does not arise in any cash inflow or outflow. We can completely ignore this. All right. So the total balance is going to be negative 
200,000 plus 500,000 minus 300,000 plus 60,000 which gives the total value of 60,000 which is in option A. What is included in the reserves of a limited company? We know that reserves is included in the equity section. All right. The first one is debentures. So we know that debentures is included in the non-current liability section. So that's not matching, meaning that's going to be an incorrect option. The second one is ordinary shares. So ordinary shares is actually the shares that cannot be a reserve, right? So this is going to be incorrect as well. Again, the third one is also a share that's not going to be reserved, so that's incorrect. And the final one is share premium. Share premiums are always going to be reserves of a limited company, so our correct answer is going to be option D. Which ratio will help a business assess its ability to meet its immediate cash requirements? Okay, the first one is expenses to revenue, so that's not going to help us assess the business's ability to meet its immediate cash requirements. So immediate cash requirements actually means the liquidity of the company. So we need to look for the liquidity ratios. So option A is not a liquidity ratio. That's incorrect. The second one is liquid as it is. The name itself contains liquid, meaning that this is the ratio that's going to help assess the business's ability to meet its immediate cash requirements. Our correct answer. The third one is non-current asset turnover. This is going to measure revenue and non-current assets. So that's not going to help us in any way to figure out the liquidity of the company. That's incorrect. And the final one is return on capital employed. So this is going to include the profit and the capital employed, which does not help in any way to determine the liquidity of the company. So that's incorrect as well. We're going to stick to our answer in option B. The following information for a business was available at the end of its financial year. We're given the inventory, bank, trade receivables, trade payables, and the rent receivables in arrears. And there is also a five-year bank loan of 20,000 repayable in equal annual installments. So this is repayable, meaning this is going to be a liability. All right, we need to figure out the current ratio. That's just going to be current assets divided by current liabilities. So we need to figure out the value of current assets first. This is going to include the inventory value, so that's 20,000. The second one is bank, but it's given on the credit side. So we know that credit, it always records the liabilities, meaning that this is going to be the bank overdraft. That's not going to be included in the current assets. Third one is trade receivables. That's an asset, so that's 35,000. And we have rent receivable in arrears. So since it's a receivable and it's outstanding receivables, so that's going to be an asset of 3,000. So we're just going to add it. So the total current assets is going to be 58,000. Now let's figure out the value for current liabilities. Okay, the first one is going to be the trade payables of 15,000. Now, what we also know is that there is a five-year bank loan, but we're going to repay in equal annual installments so that's just going to be 20,000 by 5 that's the annual installment which is going to be 4,000 so that's another 4,000 and we've determined that the bank balance is actually an overdraft which means that this amount is going to be included in the current liabilities section so that's 8,400 which gives us the total current liabilities of 27,400 all right, we have all the necessary values, so I'm just going to substitute these values. That's going to be 58,000 divided by 27,400. This gives the value of 2.12 is 21, given in option A. A manufacturing company pays its production employees basic wages at the same hourly rate every week then it also pays them a bonus based on achieving production targets. So we need to figure out what sort of cost is this an example of. So we're given the fixed cost, but we're talking about bonus, which is based on achieving production targets. So that's going to be a variable cost. So it cannot be a fixed cost. That's incorrect. The second one is semi-variable cost. So we know that for the basic wages, they're going to receive the same hourly rate every week. So that's hourly as well. That's a variable cost as well. But this is an additional variable cost, which is based on achieving production targets, which means that this is a semi-variable cost. 
That's our answer. A company receives the following units of raw material into inventory. We're given the units, we're given the per unit price, and we're given the total price as well. It then issued 240 units, meaning that 240 units were sold. Now, inventory is valued using the AVCO method, weighted average method. We need to figure out the closing value of inventory. All right, let's just figure out the total units first. So that's going to be 120 plus 100 plus 60 which is 280 units. This is the total units purchased. And we're also going to figure out the total value of purchases. So that's going to be 4,560 plus 4,000 plus 2,640, which gives the total cost of 11,200. All right, so we purchased 280 units and 240 units were sold. So the closing inventory or the remaining units we have is going to be 280 minus 240. That's 40 units. So the closing value of inventory is going to be the cost for these 40 units. And we know that the cost of 11,200 is for 280 units. All right. For 280 units, the cost is going to be 11,200. For one unit, the cost is going to be 11,200 by 280 units. Now we need the cost for 40 units. So that's just going to be 11,200 divided by 280 into 40, which is going to be 1,600. So that's the value of the closing inventory, which is given in option C. The budgeted data of unlimited is as follows. We're given the production levels and we're given the total cost, which is corresponding to these production levels. We need to figure out the budgeted fixed cost. In order to figure this out, we know that there are two costs involved in the total cost. So that's variable and fixed. So I can just make up two equations. So that's going to be 15,000 into variable cost plus fixed cost is going to give the total cost of 406,000. For the second production level, that's going to be 25,000 into variable cost plus fixed cost gives the total cost of 546,000. So I'm just going to subtract the second equation from the first one. All right, this is going to be minus 10,000 variable cost equals to minus 140,000. So the variable cost is going to be minus 140,000 divided by minus 10,000, which is $1.14 per unit. But we need to figure out the fixed cost. So I'm just going to substitute this value of 14 into the first equation. So that's going to be 15,000 into 14 plus fixed cost gives the total cost of 406,000. So we need to figure out the fixed cost. Now this is a very simple equation. So that's 406,000 minus 15,000 into 14, which gives the total fixed cost of 196,000 given in option A. And that's going to be our answer. In March, a company's overhead absorption rate was $2 per machine hour. In April, this rate increased. So we know that the overhead absorption rate is going to be overhead divided by machine hour. So if the overhead absorption rate is being increased, this just means that either the overhead is being increased or the machine hour is being decreased. So we're looking for one of these two. Now, what had increased in April causing the change in the overhead absorption rate? The first one is the cost of insurance for the factory. So cost of insurance is definitely an overhead and this is increasing, which means that this is what we're looking for. So option A is going to be correct. The second one is that the hourly pay rate of production workers. The so hourly pay rate is actually related to the direct cost, which is not going to be included in the overhead. So that's incorrect. The third one is the number of actual machine hours worked. So this is being increased, but we're looking for machine hours to be decreased. So that's incorrect. And the final one is the number of budgeted machine hours. So that's increasing as well, but we're looking for it to be decreasing. So that's incorrect. So we're going to stick to our answer of option A. A business absorbs its overheads on the basis of machine hours. And we're given the following information. We're given the actual and budgeted overheads and the machine hours. We need to figure out by how much are the overheads under or over absorbed. 
So in order to figure this out, we need to have the overhead for the same level of machine hours. We have the actual machine hours of 6700. So I'm just going to transform this budgeted overhead for the machine hour of 6700. So that's going to be 560,000 divided by 7000. So that's going to be the overhead for one machine hour, but we need it for 6700 machine hours. So I'm just going to multiply it with 6700. So this gives us a total budgeted overhead of 536,000. So we can clearly see that the actual overhead is greater than the budgeted. So this just leads in under absorption. By how much? That's just going to be the difference between the two overheads. So that's 564,000 minus 536,000, which leads to a value of 28,000. So that's going to be 28,000 under absorbed given in option D. Which situation is not usually suitable for the use of marginal costing? So we know that marginal costing uh, includes the increase or decrease in the overall cost of production due to changes in the quantity of desired output. So we're looking for situations where this marginal costing is not applicable. So the first one is negotiating a regular selling price. So we're talking about regular selling price. We're not going to consider any increase or decrease in the overall production. So that's not going to be suitable. The second one is quoting a selling price for a special order. So special order might result in an increase or decrease in the overall cost of production. So the use of marginal costing is very suitable. The third one is when there is a shortage of direct material. So if there is a shortage of direct materials, then the overall units produced can in decrease, right? So that's going to result in a decrease in the cost of production, which means that the marginal costing is very suitable for the third option as well. And for the final option, we have whether or whether to make or buy in a product. In order to do so, we can just compare the marginal cost for producing a product and the cost for buying in a product. So that's going to be suitable. So the correct option is going to be option A. The following budgeted information is available for 10,000 units. We are given the selling price, their cost, and the fixed cost. We need to figure out the budgeted break-even point in units. So that's going to be total fixed cost divided by contribution per unit. All right, let's just figure out the total fixed cost first. So that's going to include the fixed manufacturing overhead of 21. That's per unit. So we need to multiply it with the total units of 10,000. Next, we have fixed selling expenses. So that's per unit again. So we need to multiply it with the total units. So that's going to be 21 into 10,000 plus 5 into 10,000, which gives the total fixed cost of 260,000. All right, next we need to figure out the contribution per unit. So I'm just going to figure out the variable cost per unit first. So that's going to be the direct materials of 22, the variable manufacturing overhead of 2, and the variable selling expense of one. So the total variable cost per unit is going to be 25. This is per unit. All right, so in order to figure out the contribution per unit, that's just going to be the selling price minus variable cost, which is 53 minus 25. That gives us the contribution at 28 per unit. So we already have the figures for both of these. So I'm just gonna substitute it. That's 260,000 divided by 28 which gives us the budgeted break-even point in units at 9285.71 we can just round it off to 9286 which is given in option d the budgeted income statement of g limited shows the following we're given the sales variable cost fixed cost and profit for the year and we need to figure out the margin of safety in dollars so that's just going to be the sales value minus bp in dollars all right in order to figure this out we need to figure out the bp first so bp in dollars is given by the total fixed cost divided by contribution to sales ratio so we need to figure out the contribution to sales ratio first so that's going to be the total contribution divided by sales into 100 percent but we also do not know the value for contribution that's just going to be sales minus variable cost, which is going to be 400,000 minus 240,000, 
that gives us the contribution of 160,000. All right, I'm just going to substitute the values now. That's going to be 160,000 divided by 400,000 in 200%, which is going to be 40%. We can write it as 0 0.40. All right, now the total fixed cost is going to be 132,000. And the contribution to sales ratio is 0 0.40. So the BEP is going to be 330,000. Now, in order to figure out the margin of safety, I can just plug in the values for sales and the BEP in dollars, which is going to be 400,000 minus 330,000, which gives the margin of safety at 70,000, which is given in option A. A business provided the following budgeted information. We are given the break even sales revenue fixed cost and the target profit, we need to figure out the sales revenue required to achieve the target profit. All right, so I'm just going to create an equation first. So that's going to be sales minus variable cost. So this is going to be total variable cost minus fixed cost is going to give us the profit. Right? And sales minus total variable cost can be written as the total contribution. All right, so contribution minus fixed cost. We already have the value for the fixed cost at 180,000. And we require the profit of 144,000. All right, so now the total contribution is going to be 144,000 plus 180,000. So that's going to be the total contribution of 324,000. But we require the sales revenue and we're given the break even sales revenue. So, break even sales revenue is just going to be the fixed cost divided by contribution to sales ratio. That's equal to 300,000. And we also have the value for the fixed cost. That's 180,000. Divided by contribution to sales is equal to 300,000. So this means that the contribution to sales is 180,000 divided by 300,000. So that's the contribution to sales ratio of 0 0.60. All right. Now we know that the contribution to sales is equal to contribution divided by the sales value right and we have the value of contribution to sales at 0 0.60 we have the value for contribution at 324,000 we need to figure out the sales value this is a very simple equation now so sales is just going to be 324,000 divided by 0 0.60 which gives a total sales value of 540,000 which is given in option b for the last question, we have which factors should be considered when setting a budget? So the first one is availability of skilled labor. So budget is a target that is needed to achieve by the workforce in the company. So in order to achieve that target, the target should be achievable, meaning it should consider the available workforce. So the item one should be considered. So that's correct. The second one is the production capacity. Again, the budget sets a goal. And if a machine has a certain level of production capacity and the budget is indicating the amount of goods, which is way higher than the actual capacity of the machine. So that's going to be incorrect, right? So budget definitely needs to consider the production capacity as well. The third one we have is the quality of goods to be produced. Again, the quality matters the most because if we're producing goods that is of low quality, that might take fewer hours which means that the production capacity may increase according to the quality of goods. So that's something needed to be considered as well, which is given in our option A. This brings us to the end of this set. If you found this video useful, make sure to leave a like, leave a comment, and make sure you subscribe and hit the bell icon if you wish to view more of these contents in the future. Thank you.